everyone. On July 26, 2020, a story broke in the Tribune regarding the hiring of Watts, Child & Co. as the government's independent debt advisors. According to a report, Watts, Child & Co. was hired to figure out how to manage the Bahamas' international foreign currency debt exposure, both reducing interest costs on outstanding bonds and minimizing the rate demanded by investors on future issues. The article also quoted an anonymous insider as saying, Rothschild executive will also be tasked with selling the Bahamas post-COVID recovery progress to the international markets amidst the belief that they will be more credible coming from Rothschild and Co., which knows the investors and players as a participant itself. When asked about why Rothschild was engaged, Prime Minister and Minister of Finance Philip Davis said that what's child role was to look at the profile of the country's debt with the view of seeing how best the government can meet its obligation and respond to as well as create more headroom for the country to move forward without restructuring government debt. Welcome back to another episode of CFAL Talks. I am Pamela Ferguson, Vice President of Investments here at CFAL, and joining me in studio today are Lachelle White, Investments Manager, and Angelo Butler, Senior Analyst here at CFAL. In today's episode, our panel will explore the question, can Watts Child save the Bahamas from its quagmire of debt? So let's get right into the discussion. During an exclusive interview with Paige McCartney, senior business reporter at the Nassau Guardian, Eric Lalo, Watchchild and co-managing director and head of sovereign advisory, stated that there is nothing shocking about the country's fiscal state and rising debt, given the twin exogenous shocks of Hurricane Dorian and the COVID-19 pandemic. Do you agree? with Lalo's statement, yes or no, and I want you to defend your answers. Yes, I agree with his statement to an extent. I am not shocked um, at the government's um, debt levels. Um, we've seen this trajectory over the past few years. Um, we've seen an increase in debt on the fiscal decline. So I think it was coming before um, we had Hurricane Dorian and before the pandemic those um, events just exacerbated um, the situation. Um, it's the government had to borrow more money to deal with those events, um, and that's understandable. That's nothing more. That's um, nothing shocking about that. But I think that um, and for the pandemic, it was not unique to us. A lot of countries also had to borrow, but. I think that we were, you know, on this sort of path where we had were too comfortable with just borrowing, um, borrowing money. And when we actually absolutely had to do it, um, it just sort of piled up more debt upon the existing debt um, that we have. Our economy is now recovering. And so we are in a better fiscal position, but we still haven't gotten a handle um, on our debt situation. Yeah, I would agree. I, you know, I would say I would be shocked if you know I went to sleep in 2010 and and woke up today and saw the debt and you'd you know ask yourself, oh, how did this happen? Um, but there are reasons and you know factors in between that have caused that. Like you mentioned, the um, Hurricane Dorian taking out the you know two of the major economies within um, the Bahamas and of course the COVID pandemic, um, the world shutting down. You've seen not just an increase in debt locally. Um, but an increase in debt around the world. And so, you know, not surprised by it. Um, the level of it is concerning, I would say. But overall, it's, you know, given what we've been through, um, you could always say it could could have been lower. We could have done things a bit differently, but I'm not really shocked that, you know, you would have said that. I agree. Not shocked as well, because um, we, this, we have been on this trend for some time, mm -hmm. even prior to um, Hurricane Dorian or the pandemic. We had excessive uh, debt levels. I do believe, though, we ought to be concerned mm -hmm. about the level um, of debt because notwithstanding how our high debt level, which is measured by uh, total de government debt to GDP, um, came about, be it the hurricane, be it the pandemic, be it 
Hurricane Dorian specifically, mm -hmm. the fact is that we are borrowing a lot of money and we are almost 100% debt to GDP. And so I think that is tremendously um, concerning. And with our junk bond status and our lack of economic um, growth, then we can see where financing the level of borrowing that we have done in the past and even right now is going to be very expensive. And so we ought to be, I believe, um, concerned with the high level of debt that we're having. And it puts us in a difficult position in, in managing that trade-off between um, spending for important uh, areas of our economy like healthcare and social safety net and also investing in infrastructure on the one hand and on the other hand of trying to contain mm -hmm. our debt level. So it yeah. puts us and in a very difficult... And trying to service our debt yeah. because mm -hmm. you don't want to go into default because mm -hmm. that'll make it... That's a whole other... A whole other issue to deal with. Yeah, so I think we ought to be concerned. So in 2007, the government's foreign debt stock stood at $296 million, or 3.56% of GDP. A lot of to marinate for a bit. <laughs> a lot of to marinate. Prior back? to Hurricane Dorian in 2018, the foreign debt stock ballooned to $2.6 billion, or 20.3% of GDP. Allow that to marinate. <laughs> At the end of June 2022, the government of the Bahamas' foreign debt stock was recorded at $4.95 billion, representing 46.57% of the total government debt stock and 44.58% of GDP. Eric Lalo indicated that the Bahamas should go on a diet from the international capital markets for a while. Why do you suppose Lalo made such recommendations? Because this is just unsustainable. I mean, I can't remember, but I think we the first time we went to the international market to borrow was in like 1990s. But now it's just like... When you say in 2007, our debt was only like three and a half percent of GDP, you'd be like, can we go? But I'll even take the 20 percent <laughs> of GDP. It's like, yeah, but when you we are tipping towards that 50 percent um, and this is not local debt, this is international debt in foreign currency. We can't print foreign currency. We have to rely on economic growth and economic growth has not been stellar over the past few years. So I do think that the Bahamas needs to um, go on a, a debt diet. They need to go on a crash. I, I don't know what it is. But a debt need, diet for the capital market or a debt diet? A period. debt diet, period. <laughs> because um, I don't see this is um, simply um, not sustainable. And you, we've been heading in this um, direction for a while. And if we continue to borrow and we have this high debt stock, and we have we don't have enough revenues or um to service it or to grow our economy. Investors are gonna become concerned and they're gonna wanna um demand more yield um if they're gonna take on our debt. So I don't think this is um sustainable. I don't think it'll be easy to sell um the Bahamas' debt um in the future if we have to borrow more. Yeah, and I think one of the points he mentioned was that we need to wait till there's more demand for our debt than um, supply and in simple economic terms, if you know you're putting out or trying to borrow 200 million and there's only demand for say 100 million, what's going to happen is the price is going to go down, right? And and in the bond world, if as the price of a bond goes down, the yield or cost of the bond um, goes up, and we're seeing extreme. And I think we'll cover that soon, um, where you're seeing these sharp increases in the yields on our government bonds. Um, and so, you know, he's pretty much saying that it's going to be very expensive for us to go to the market right now. Um, and so, you know, it's it's borrowing at 15 and 20 percent is just not sustainable. And, and, you know, it's going to eat up at your budget. Like Lachelle mentioned, the important thing, too, is it's in foreign currency, um, you know, debt in Bahamian dollars. You have significantly more flexibility, um, you know, in terms of rolling over. Um, negotiating, it's easier to negotiate with, you know, your citizens and your residents than it is to go into the international markets where they don't care, you know, who you are, what you, 
you're about. They just want to make sure they get their funds back. So um, he's pretty much saying, you know, with the pandemic, we've had to borrow a lot of money in um, U.S. dollars. And I think there was no way around a lot of that. Um, your economy shut down. You still needed to import. Um, but now that things have, you know, started to come back to normal, you have to, you know, take a diet from that, um, cut back a bit on it and, and go forward. If you're borrowing local currency, that's fine. You can kind of control that. But when you're borrowing in foreign currency or USD, you need foreign currency earnings in order to service that debt that you have little or no control over, right? And so back in the day when we had the, the level of tourists and the, and the foreign direct investment, it was sufficient foreign currency earnings to service the debt at the time. But it, it can't do that now. And so what governments had to do is start to borrow. And I think this all started, and we've said this over and over um, on, on these podcasts, it all started after 2007, where the government had to go and borrow foreign currency because it wasn't earning sufficient from tourism and from um, foreign direct investment. And so that's why we are where um, we are today. And so I guess what Eric Lalo is saying is that, you know, we need to look for some not so traditional means that we, we've used in the recent past. We did it with the IDB. I think it was that 400 million there about that we went through with the IDB. And I read the, um, the quarterly public debt statistical bulletin, that's fiscal year 2021, 2022 for quarter four at the end of June 2022. And they said, it said that on January 28, 2022, USD 105 million loan from Credit Suisse and the National Bank of Jamaica taken out to cover budgetary requirements. So I guess if you go to the National Bank of Jamaica, you're not getting 50, you're not, they're not asking for 15%, but probably more lower um, percent. And so maybe that's what he's saying. You don't go to the capital markets, but if you can find these arrangements on the side where you can borrow money, then that would be good um, in the short term. Eric Lalo said, he, he said that we um, should put ourselves in the position where there is a demand for the Bahamas paper rather than the other way around. But, you know, when I look at that, we have to fix our economic position. We have to look at our economic prospects and we have to fix that in order for there to be a demand mm -hmm. for our paper as opposed to us going to investors and, and, begging. and begging them yeah. to invest. We have to make ourselves look desirable mm -hmm. as an investment. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we haven't been doing that we, because it's been so easy for so long. Um, people, you know, say, oh, you know, the Bahamas, they have tourism, they have revenues, they have this and they have that. And now, so we were able to get the money pretty easily at, you know, fairly favorable rates. But now it's like, Mm, no, <laughs> like you're going to pay me 20% if you want me to take on this risk. Yeah, so we, we really have to do some stuff. And I, I just think there's there's just no way around. And and, and and stuff that we have been saying, I mean, um, the citizenry persons in the industry have been saying to the government to do for many years. And so until we, we just buckle down and get this stuff done, I think we're going to be for, you know, heading for a bumpy, a bumpy ride. So recently... The Bahamas U.S. dollar government bonds tanked by as much as 36 cents on a dollar for some of the government bond issues. What caused this substantial reduction in price? And did inflation have anything to do with this directly or indirectly? Uh, well, like you mentioned before, the Bahamas bonds are really junk. Mm -hmm. um, I remember a time, long, long time ago, not so long, mm -hmm. that we were investment grade, yeah. you know. A, you know. started out at A, a rating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a, a rating, and then it systematically declined. And, you know, we had Dorian and the pandemic and, you know, low economic growth um, and everything. And we kept borrowing, so our fiscal position worsened. Um, I think that the recent um, tanking of the... The government bonds was due after the it was revealed that Rothschild was hired. People, investors were really spooked. Like, is the government um, planning to like restructure this debt? Um, so I think that's um, one of the the main reasons. And then you have the U.S. Our, this is the U.S. dollar debt we're talking about in the U.S. Um, Federal Reserve started increasing rates. So that could have also a lesser effect. Um, that could have also had um, an effect. And I think inflation. 
did have some indirect effects, inflation, but that's nothing um, unique to the Bahamas bondholdings. Usually, if um, investors expect um, higher inflation in the future, that's going to um, um, affect their the, the cash flows, the value of their cash flows. So they are going to um, put in a higher premium for inflation risk. So all of those things had um, an effect on the bond prices. But I think it was that Rothschild announcement that really um, caused, you know, that shock to the market. Like people were wondering, what is this about? The prices have since stabilized and gone up, but for, I think, maybe like a few weeks there, it was, yeah, you've seen things like half, <laughs> like 50 high cents. Volatility, of the, like, high volatility. Mm-hmm. And this was like across the board mm-hmm. from the issue maturing in 2024. I think mm-hmm. the latest one is in 2038. Mm-hmm. So all across the board, we saw it. And in the longer term issues, it was felt the most. And I think this, again, shows the importance of, you know, controlling the level of international debt because, you know, in the Bahamas, the Bahamas debt, the government through central bank issues it at a price and generally it stays around that price. You know, the investors don't have a lot of say in what the price um, of the bond is. But when you go on the international market, people tell you what they're going to pay for your bonds. And so, you know, you could say as much as you want. If people believe it's worth 80 cents on a dollar, then that's what they're going to offer. And if someone needs to sell, they'll have to sell it at that price or either hold it. And so the market dynamics are very different um, compared to the Bahamas. And you also in that in the U.S. markets, you have speculators, right? It, it doesn't always have to be someone buying the bond to hold it long term. You have people that are short selling or betting against the bonds to make a quick profit. And so you have all of this trading activity um, that takes place. And so sometimes the reality is different from you know, what is the paper or or real, um, you know, level of confidence in it. And so that's why I think we have to be careful. Um, You have, you know, so much factors out there that can drive the yields and and that can affect you when you actually need to borrow, right? Because right now you you would know the government said that the bonds pay a fixed interest payment. So the yield on it doesn't really matter. But if your bond is yielding 15%, when you go to issue a new bond, you're going to pay 15%, not the 5% that you're currently paying. And so that's where the challenge comes in and why the government needs to, um, you know, go on a diet <laughs> um, for the international debt. Um. And to put it all in perspective, I, um, in, in 2018, when the then minister administration issued a $650 uh, million U.S. bond, the interest rate on those bonds, so like 6.5%. And then in the heart of the pandemic in 2020, they issued $600 million um, of U.S. bond, and that interest rate was 8.95%. And when all of that happened around about the 27th there about um, of July, when um, the the price just tanked for a lot of those bonds, they lost. Like the, the $650 million bond that was issued in 2018, the yield went to like 15%. And like you said, Angelo, what happens is the, if the government had tried to go to the market during that time, they would have had to pay 15% in order um, to, to to place those bonds. Yeah, and I, I remember when they issued that bond, you know, there was a lot of news and information person saying, oh, we paying 9%, you know, 8.95, <laughs> don't, don't we have better professionals than this? And I said... <laughs> For for us to be boring in the middle of a pandemic at eight point nine five percent is pretty good. I say this this is a deal, right? We should borrow two billion of this because you see when they issued this year, although they had the IDB guarantee, when you look at the actual yield on those bonds, it's about thirteen and a half percent, and so and the economy is better now than it was during the mm-hmm. pandemic, and so you know these things do compile over time, but um, yeah, it, you. Whatever the market says is what you're going to pay going forward. And I think, too, the government has to be transparent. The government has to be transparent and, and, and to be aware that, you know, you may try to hide things from Bohemian, but when you're dealing with foreign currency uh, debt, the international market out there, they are they are digging and they are trying to find out what's going on. And so if they hear something that it appears as if you're trying to hide it from them, that affect um, bond prices and that affect people perception of the investments. Yeah, I think that's what happened with the Rothschild mm-hmm. announcement because it was leaked news. It wasn't like announced by the government. 
correct. So Simon Wilson, financial secretary in the Ministry of Finance, was quoted in one of the dailies as saying that the price of the Bahamas government U.S. denominated bonds does not reflect the confidence investors have in the Bahamas. What are your thoughts on the financial secretary's statement and what, in your professional opinion, is needed for investors to have confidence in the Bahamas government U.S. denominated debt? Well, traditionally, when you have these sudden spikes in yield, these large, it's because investors um, have lost confidence. Something shocked them about the issue um, and they need reassurance. So, like, for example, when you had Russia invade Ukraine, the prices of the bonds um, tanked and yields um, went up because, you know, people, this is a exogenous. What is happening? What's going on? And I think that um, happened with the Rothschild announcement and people were wondering, is this debt sustainable? Are they going to refinance this debt or restructure this debt or default on this debt? So investors were spooked by that. Um I think so. Prices do reflect, um, in my opinion, they do reflect investor confidence. Um, and it's often the investors are wondering if the country is able to repay this debt. And there are, of course, there are other um, factors that are common across the market. We've seen there was a large market decline um, throughout this year, a global market decline and sell off of risky asset, riskier assets. So that had... Um, effect in it, but at the end of the day, it was um, investor um, confidence um, in the um, Bahamas' ability to um, repay the debt. And I think that we have to show investors that we are prop um, capable of properly managing um, our fiscal affairs in order for them to um, gain confidence um, in our economy and continue to lend us money at much more favorable <laughs> rates. Um, but yeah, but I'd say like as Angelo alluded to earlier, often the current yield on a bond is going to be used as a benchmark for any new debt that you issue. So yeah, you have to be careful with that. Yeah, and I, I think you have different types of investors as well. You have, um, you know, even with all of these declines, you have some investors, maybe some of the large insurance companies that'll hold them and ride it out and everything. But you also have some investors who, you know, they buy it 100 and it's 95. They say, you know what, I'm, I'm out of this, I'm gone. So um, I'm sure that, you know, any country can f speak to and find to some investors who would have some sort of confidence or, you know, belief that, you know, everything will be fine. But two, you have to look at the way they structure things as well, right? They, they may lend you the money, but they want it this condition. You have to put funds in a sinking fund. And so, um, you know, you can make people confident. It's, it's just what you have to do to to do that. A Bloomberg News article reported that the Bahamas is among 19 emerging markets who may eventually struggle to pay their debt based on current discounted prices and yields demanded by investors. It was among 10 nations identified as falling into this distressed territory since the beginning of 2022. What effect, if any, does the recent reduction in bond prices have on the Bahamian economy? Well, it doesn't really have a direct effect on economic growth or anything, but um, like we've all said earlier, um, if it becomes more expensive um, for the Bahamas to borrow, um, debt servicing costs are going to grow. They're going to become higher. And that money that you're using to service your debt could have been money that was used in other areas of the economy to help um, your economy grow. So... Um, if you're not investing in, if you're invest, if you're using monies to pay off interest and not using monies to pave roads, then that's a problem that's going to affect your economy and your economic growth. So I think, um, if we hire, um, the more money we have to pay to service our debt, um, the more detrimental it is for our economy. Yeah. And so the, the, the real effect is the lower the price, the, the higher the cost. And, and so it just makes it more difficult. You have to, you know, pay more to attract more investors. And, um, you know, it, it. I guess it reduces your um, flexibility when external shocks come. Um, if you ever need to quickly go and tap the market, um, you don't want it to be in a time where, you know, the costs are exorbitant. So I think the goal would be to quickly um, fix things as best as possible, get confidence back up, get the yields to a more meaningful level so that, you know, as shocks come up, um, you can go back um, into the markets. 
So, do you believe that Rothschild and Co. can fix the Bahamas debt quadmire? I don't think any one person or group of persons um, can fix the Bahamas' debt quagmire. I think that we need a comprehensive plan and we need to get all local state and international stakeholders involved. And I mean, I guess to me, I sort of see it as some sort of panacea. You want to say, I've hired these people to look like you're doing something, but I feel as if all along we've known um, what was happening and the direction that we were headed and we sort of just sort of ignored it. So, I mean, hopefully now this is maybe you have these voices out here, but I think I don't think that it's just that one thing. Just hiring one group of consultants is going to um, solve our problem. Yeah, and I, I, I always say it goes back to will. I think financial professionals locally have been saying a lot of these things for years and years and years. And, you know, for somehow we still have this mindset that we need someone foreign to come and tell us this. And only when they say it is it, you know, this big uproar and stuff. But people have been saying this from I was in college, from I was in high school. And, you know, the the will just hasn't been there, I think. Um, and, and there have been things that have come up, um, shocks and, and stuff that we can't control. But there are things that we can control that we just refuse to do. And so we find ourselves here um, paying someone to tell us the same thing <laughs> we've been saying all along. I agree. Eric Lalo and Rothschild cannot say anything to the government that the government or successive administrations have not heard from Bahamians within uh, this economy. Now, maybe he can, they can lend us money at the <laughs> rate. <laughs> They should refinance. That, that, that's the, that. Yeah, maybe that's what they're here to do. And if that's the case, well, then by all means, <laughs> come in. But I don't think there's anything they can tell our officials that they haven't already heard. And like Angelo said, it takes the will. And I think it would be good to see, you know, what percent of our debt do they have? Or, you know, if they're advising us, they should have some confidence mm-hmm. in and be willing to <laughs> invest as well. So they should have some skin in the game um, rather than just, you know, Giving us advice. So you say before they accept, sign this contract, let's take on some of the Bahamas debt. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> That's a good idea. That's a good idea. <laughs> Michelle and Angelo, we have come to the end of another episode of C-File Talks. Thank you so much for contributing to this discussion. Thank you, audience, for tuning in. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, please send us a note at info at cfile.com or visit our website at www.cfile.com and show your support. Thank you, Cfile, for supporting this episode. Until next time. Bye.